Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Mark chapter three. It's a good day. Um, it's a beautiful day. And so here we go. Mark chapter three. I'm pretty excited about jumping into this with you. And he, Jesus, entered again into the synagogue. And there was a man there which had a withered hand and they watched him whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day, that they might accuse him. Scribes and Pharisees love to accuse Jesus of stuff if you haven't figured out already. And he saith unto the man which had the willard hand, stand forth. And he saith unto them, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they held their peace. Because, I mean, how do you answer a question like that? And when he had looked around about them with anger, on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, he saith unto the man, Stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored as whole as the others. And the Pharisees went forth and straightway took counsel with the Herodians against him how they might destroy him. That's what you do whenever somebody heals, you look for a way to destroy him. Jesus, that was tongue in cheek, by the way. Anyways, Jesus, this is his third confrontation that took place in the synagogue. Um, whenever he had, um, whenever he had entered um, the synagogue, he encountered a man with a shriveled hand intent on finding a basis of accusation to Christ. They challenged him. Is it right to heal on the Sabbath? Here, here he has this widespread controversy as to what uh, medication was allowable on the Sabbath. The, the Jewish had this controversy going, and Jesus answered the question by referring them to their own practices. And the life of the one of their animals were in jeopardy. Now, you got to piece this together with Book of Mark and Luke and John. You piece it together. In the life of, if he asked them a question, if one of your animals were in jeopardy on the Sabbath, would you preserve it or would you let the animal die? So Jesus concluded that it was lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Since such action was not contrary to the law, it was actually contrary to the Pharisees' law, but not the law of God. Jesus commanded the men, stretch forth your hand. Um, at first, they were very furious with Christ. Um, they were infuriated because Jesus had publicly humiliated them. It had less to do with the man and more to do with the fact that Jesus humiliated them. And second, so that was the first thing that happened. Then secondly, they began their plan to kill him. They wanted to kill him because he was one who rejected their traditions. and He didn't want people to turn on him. And thirdly, he entered into alliance with Herodians. These were their enemies, but the enemy of my enemy is my friend, as they say. And they solicited their support and attempt to kill Jesus. They were determined that he must die. You see, the Sabbath controversy marked a very important element. The opposition of the Pharisees was no longer veiled, but in the open. They were determined to put him to death, and they would solicit help from any party that could help them accomplish their goal. So that's kind of what happened there. But Jesus withdrew himself with his disciples to the sea, and a great multitude of Galilee followed him from Judea, and from Jerusalem, and from Indium, and beyond Jordan. And they about Tyre and Sidon, and a great multitude, when they had heard what great things he did, came unto him. And he spake to his disciples that a small ship should wait on him because of the multitude, lest they should throng him, press him. For he had healed many, and so much that they pressed him upon to touch him, as many as had plagues. And the unclean spirits, when they saw him, fell down before him and cried, saying, Thou art the Son of God. And he straightly charged them that they should not make him known. Jesus shows his authority to heal in these scriptures, the geographical notation, notation is what I kind of like to highlight here, that Jesus became known, uh, Jesus knew about such great hostility that he left Jerusalem and returned to Galilee. Multitudes followed him from Judea, Jerusalem, from beyond Jordan, not only the nation of Israel, but now the nations of, are, around Jerusalem are starting to hear about Jesus. Um, multitudes from that area came to hear his word, see his miracles. Jesus was not only now known in the spiritual realm. We know he was known in the spiritual realm because um, the devils knew who he was. He wasn't just known in Israel, but now the world is taking notice of who Jesus is. And he goeth up into a mountain and calleth unto him who he would. And they came to him and he ordered, ordained 12 that they should be with him and that he might send them forth to preach have the power to heal sickness, cast out devils. Simon, surnamed Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother of James, and his surname, uh, Bonaregus, which is the sons of thunder. Um, 
and Andrew and Philip and Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon, the Canaanite, and Judas, which also betrayed him, and they went into the house. So in this setting, Jesus chose 12 from among the multitude and his disciples in order to commission them as apostles. Now, teams must be chosen. Jesus deliberately chose to all 12 of his team, or his disciples. He didn't cast a vote. He made a personnel decision himself. Note what we learn about team building from Jesus' selection of the 12. Selection. He handpicked them. Luke 6 and 12 tells us that he prayed all night. Motivation. He selected the ones he personally wanted. There was chemistry. There was a lot to choose from. He chose 12. Connection. He chose them to be with him. He modeled life in close proximity. Permission, he released them and gave them specific assignments. And commission, he empowered them and gave them authority to do their job. That's what a, a good leader does. He gives people, he empowers them to do their job. And the multitude came to him and said, uh, again, so that they could, this, uh, not, I'm sorry, so that they could not so eat as mu <laughs> much, bah, and the multitude cometh together again so that they could not so much as eat bread. And when, and when his friends heard it, I got a little tongue tied there. When his friends heard it, they went out to lay hold on him for they said he is beside himself. They, Jesus is in a house. The multitude comes to him so much they can't even eat because everybody wants to see Jesus. And his friends heard it. They went out, they put their hand, they, they got a hold of Jesus because they said to themselves, he's beside himself. And the scribes which came down from Jerusalem said, he hath beels above the prince of devils cast out devils. And he calleth them to them and said unto them in parables, how can Satan cast out Satan? And if a kingdom be divided against itself, the kingdom cannot stand. And if a house be divided against the house, the house cannot stand. And if Satan rise up against himself and be divided, he cannot stand but hath an end. No man can enter a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except first he bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house. Verily I say unto you, all sins shall be forgiven unto the Son of Man, and blaspheme is whereas so they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but in, is in danger of eternal damnation, because they said, he hath an unclean spirit. Once again, the multitudes crowding around Jesus, his friends consider that he needed to be protected. So they sought to take charge of him and hold of him. Their statement, he's out of his mind, indicated they thought his zeal bordered on insanity. Think of it this way, like a politician who makes his secret service constantly nervous because he loves to walk the rope line. He loves to handshake. He loves to high five. He loves to be in contact with people. And that's how Jesus was. He needed to be in contact with his people and his disciples were like, this is complete madness. We can't even eat because of him. <laughs> The scribes said he hath Beelzebub, the prince of the devils, cast out devils. They believed that the world of evil spirits formed a great army, each with a head and subordinates, its rank and file, the, the whole under the command of Satan. And they believed that Jesus was in that rank and file. Their concern was that he might win the people to listen to his teachings, and they would not admit that his power was divine. And so the idea of that time necessarily assumed that it must be the opposite. If it's not divine, it's of Satan himself, Bill's above. Jesus then asked some questions and statements. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, can't stand. House divided against itself, can't stand. If Satan rise up against itself and be divided, can't stand. How hath an end, but hath an end. No man can enter a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man and then he spoils his house. Think of it like this. Satan is the strong man of this world, or of people's lives. It may have been the stronghold of your life, my life. Jesus came to spoil his party. Jesus binds what's been binding you and takes over, and he is now the king of our hearts, our lives. And our response to Jesus Christ determines our eternal destiny. Our response to Jesus Christ determines our eternal destiny. There cometh unto him brethren and his mother standing without and sent unto him, calling him. And the multitude sat about him and said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brother seek without uh, for thee. And he answered and said, Who is my mother? Who is my brother? And he looked around them, sat around and said, Behold, my mother and my brothers. 
For whoever will do the will of God, the same as my brother, my sister, and my mother. At the end of this chapter, his mother and his brothers want to speak with him, but the crowd is too strong for them to get in the room. Jesus uses this opportunity to speak a spiritual truth, saying that the only ones who accept him would be his spiritual family. What does that mean? How do you accept Jesus? Um, what do you have to do to do that? The answer is actually found in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, when it says, repent. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, the Holy Ghost is the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus. Jesus wants his Spirit in your heart. Repentance, baptism in his name, being filled with his Spirit is the entrance into his kingdom. And that is um, chapter 3 of the book of Mark. I hope that you enjoyed it, and tomorrow we will get into chapter four. God bless you, and I'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.